Hi, I'm Tom, coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio. I am at the world headquarters of the International Institute for the Advancement of Sourdough Science and Research, also known as My Kitchen. Thank you for selecting this video. In today's video, we will be continuing the search for the answer to one of the most complicated questions for beginning sourdough bakers, and that is when is bulk fermentation done? This is the fifth episode in this series. If you're not familiar with this series, I recommend watching some of the earlier episodes to catch up with where we are in the process. In episode three in particular, I introduce the incredible bulkomatic system that we developed here at the Institute. This is a specialized tool for sourdough bakers to help you determine when bulk fermentation is done. What we'll be doing in today's episode is focusing specifically on one of the variables that can impact bulk fermentation time. And that variable is the percentage of starter or leaven that you add to your recipe. Now the starter or leaven percentage, which is sometimes known as the inoculation rate, can impact the speed at which your bulk fermentation is completed. So for example, in the recipe that I use, the tartine bread basic country loaf recipe, very popular recipe that you can find on the internet. This calls for a starter or leaven inoculation rate of 20%. That means for a thousand gram flour weight recipe, we use 200 grams of leaven or starter. I'll use the term leaven and starter interchangeably throughout this video. That 20% rate impacts the recommended time that it takes to complete bulk fermentation. For example, in this recipe, it recommends four and a half hours from the time that you add that 20% leaven to the flour, four and a half hours later at the recommended temperature, your bulk fermentation should be done. A lot of people ask the question, what if I wanna speed that up or slow it down? So what we'll be experimenting with today is we'll be baking four loaves of bread with different starter percentages that will theoretically speed up or slow down the bulk fermentation rate. Now, why is this important? It's important as a baker to understand what are all the tools that you have available to you to be able to impact your baking schedule. This is one of the toughest parts of sourdough baking is that it's a long process. You know, it takes 36 hours to bake a loaf of bread. Some people say, why do you even do it? because it tastes great. But the timing is always a challenge. Every time you wanna bake a loaf of bread, you have to think about what am I doing over the next day and a half? It gets a little complicated. So if we can introduce tools that say, I have a short period of time between when I'm starting my recipe and when I need to bake, can I speed up that process by adding more leaven to the recipe? Or for example, if you wanted to do an overnight bulk fermentation, you could add less leaven to the recipe, and that would then stretch out your bulk fermentation time. So that's the reason that we're looking at this. When you think about the role of leaven or starter in the recipe, it's basically doing two things. One is when you add your leaven to your recipe, you're introducing the microbes from your starter, which is primarily yeast and lactic acid bacteria, the yeast is what rises the dough. So you're, that's what introduces the microbes into the recipe that are going to create the carbon dioxide to rise the dough. And whenever you add sourdough yeast or sourdough starter, along with the yeast comes its traveling companion, lactic acid bacteria. The lactic acid bacteria also eats the starches and sugars, the same things that the yeast is eating, and it's creating flavor in the loaf. That's really what gives sourdough its unique flavor. So when we talk about adding more or less leaven to the recipe, two things are happen, happening. You're introducing more yeast cells if you add more leaven, so that would then accelerate the CO2 creation and should rise your loaf faster, but you're also adding more lactic acid bacteria and that can impact the flavor. So what's the impact of flavor on a fast loaf versus a slow loaf? This is somewhat subjective, but in general, if you're looking for a very tangy, sour flavor, which is what a lot of people look for, generally speaking, that comes with longer, slower fermentations. So if I make the tartine bread recipe per the book and I use 20% leaven, but I say I want a tangier, more sour loaf, 
I want to slow down my bulk fermentation process to give the lactic acid bacteria a little bit more time to create that sourness. So I would use less leaven in my recipe and stretch out the time. If I wanted to accelerate my bulk fermentation time and I add more leaven, so let's say for example, I go from 20% up to 30%, I'm going to get a more acidic flavor. When you do the faster fermentations, you get a little bit of a vinegary, biting acidic flavor, slow fermentations, you get that tangy flavor. So in addition to just trying to impact our baking schedule or control our time, you also have to be aware that you're impacting the flavor of the bread as well. That's just something that comes along with the higher or lower leaven percentages. So in today's experiment, we'll be baking four loaves of bread. One of the loaves will be exactly by the book. That'll be our baseline comparison using the 20% leaven recipe from the Tartine Bread book. Then I'll bake one loaf with a higher leaven percentage. We'll go up to 30%. That should theoretically bulk ferment faster. And then we'll bake two loaves with a lower leaven percentage. We'll go down to 10% and 5%. And those loaves should theoretically take longer to complete their bulk fermentation. Now you might ask the question, why do we need to do this experiment? Hasn't somebody figured this out? I've searched all over the internet and, th and there's very little guidance on there in terms of calculating how much faster would a loaf bulk ferment if you go from 20 to 30% or how much slower would it bulk ferment if you went from 20 to 10% because the relationship of the yeast and lactic acid bacteria fermentation is nonlinear. So what we know for certain is that if I go from a 20% leaven recipe to a 10% leaven recipe where I'm taking half of the leaven into the recipe, that doesn't double the fermentation time. And similarly, when I go from 20% to 30%, I'm increasing that leaven by 50%. It doesn't reduce my time by 50%. So there's a fermentation curve that's happening in the background that's not a straight line, it's more of an exponential curve, and it's not linear, meaning a doubling of the leaven doesn't cause a halving of the fermentation time, or a halving of the leaven doesn't cause a doubling of the fermentation time. So today, we're gonna do an experiment to try to figure this out and get some real statistical data to help you with your baking schedule. Now, I have searched all over the internet to try to find this information. It's just not out there. That's the reason we're doing this experiment today. You'll find some people, some what I call the citizen scientists of the sourdough consortium, who sometimes publish these complicated spreadsheets and things like this. And these are shared along the dark recesses of the sourdough interweb to try to calculate what this impact would be by changing the leaven percentage. These are generally unreliable and all of them start with a disclaimer that says, I don't know if this really works, but here's a table that I created. So we're gonna do our own experiment today, and then at least we'll have one baseline we can go off of for a specific known popular recipe, tartine bread basic country loaf, which recommends 20% leaven. We're gonna have a good idea of what happens if you change that to 30%, 10%, or 5%. Now, if you've seen the other videos in this series, you'll know that this changing of the recipe has implications for the incredible bulkomatic system. This tool is something we created here at the Institute to help us determine when bulk fermentation is done. It looks at nine variables, three recipe variables, temperature, time, percent rise, those are usually given in the recipe, and six observational variables. Is the dough domed on top? Are there bubbles on top? Are there bubbles on the side? How does the dough shake in the bowl? Can you do a window pane? and how does it smell? Those are more subjective variables, and I go through those in great detail in episode three of this series. I recommend you watch that one if you haven't seen it yet. But one of these variables will change if we change the leaven percentage because this tool is calibrated specifically to this recipe. It shows the recommended time for bulk fermentation is three and a half to four and a half hours. That's at the 20% recommended 11 percentage in the tartine basic country loaf. If we change that to 30 percent, this guidance would go out the window because we would expect it to be faster fermentation. If we change that rate to be lower than 20 percent, this time 
would be longer than recommended. So we're only going to be looking for the impact in that one variable is the change in time. Because when I add more or less leaven to the recipe, everything else on this chart stays the same. We're looking for the same percent rise, we're gonna bulk ferment at the same target temperature, and we're gonna look for all those other visual variables when we're bulk fermenting the dough to see how it behaves through the bulk fermentation process. This will be a good test of the tool to see are there other things that might actually change when you change the leaven percentage. I don't think there will be, but that's why I really wanna do this side-by-side -side test. Does the window pane develop differently with the higher or lower leaven percentage? Does the smell of the, the, the bulk fermented dough change when you're using a higher or lower leaven percentage? We'll see. So we'll compare all the nine variables. It'll be a good test and a good calibration for the incredible bulk system. Now let's briefly recap the recipe so we can get down to business. I follow the tartine bread basic country loaf recipe in all of my videos. This is the standard I use for every one of these experiments. So we have consistency across the board. This recipe is widely known. It's available on the internet at the Tartine Bakery website if you wanna go there to find it, or you can buy Chad Robertson's Tartine Bread book. This is a great book, I strongly recommend it. If you're not familiar with the recipe, I'll give you the quick rundown. This recipe typically makes two loaves of bread. It calls for 1,000 grams of flour. That flour is a mix of 90% bread flour, 10% whole wheat flour, it calls for 750 grams of water or a 75% nominal hydration rate. It calls for 200 grams of starter, which is your 20% inoculation rate and 20 grams or 2% salt. That's the basics of the recipe. We follow the recipe by the book. In today's experiment, I like to tell you what flours I'm using because different flours will impact your recipes differently. This is a pretty standard mix and I use this in all of the other recipes in this uh, When is Bulk Fermentation Done series. I'm doing a 50-50 mix of my bread flour. So I'm using uh, half Central Milling Company organic high mountain high gluten flour. This is half of my bread flour. And I'm using for the other half of my bread flour, Central Milling Company organic artisan baker's craft plus flour. These make up the 90% bread flour called for in the recipe. So 45% so of the total flour is the high mountain, 45% is the ABC plus. And then for the other 10%, I use King Arthur whole wheat flour. This is the same flour that I've used in all these other experiments, so this should be a consistent comparison with those. A few other key points is when I do the bulk fermentation according to this recipe, it recommends a temperature range between 78 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 25.5 to 28 degrees Celsius. I follow that range religiously. I use my oven with the light on as a proofing chamber. I measure the temperature of the dough every 30 minutes or sometimes even more frequently. So monitoring your dough temperature is critically important during bulk fermentation. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that we'll be doing that as well. And then lastly, for this specific recipe, I'm going to be making half-sized loaves. So that standard 1,000 gram recipe usually makes two loaves, according to the book, we're gonna be making four loaves. So these are roughly 250 gram flour weight loaves. There's a little peculiarity in this recipe. Normally I can just divide this by four and use 250 grams of flour in each one of the four loaves. But because we're changing the leaven percentage and I want all four of these loaves to come out exactly the same weight at the end, so the flour, the water, the salt, and the leaven, I have to slightly adjust the flour weights up and down because I'm adding more or less starter. So I'll just put the details up here on the screen for each of the four loaves for the people who really want the fine grained detail. These are roughly 250 grams of flour per loaf with some small adjustments to account for the higher or lower starter quantities. And if you're familiar with my other experiments in this series, we do something here where we're really trying to focus on just the bulk fermentation step. So at the end of bulk fermentation, I basically take the dough, flop it into a shaping basket, put it in the refrigerator for an overnight cold retard, and then we'll bake these up in the morning. But I don't do pre-shaping or final shaping of these loaves. The reason for that is because we're trying to put an x-ray machine on this dough right at the end of bulk fermentation. And by doing pre-shaping and final shaping, 
you can sometimes introduce irregularities into the dough that look like indications of overproofing or underproofing. So we basically skip those steps, we bake up the bulk fermented dough, and then what we will get here tomorrow morning is we'll get four loaves of bread with wildly different bulk fermentation times. I mean, between these four loaves, we're probably gonna have one loaf that's under five hours of bulk fermentation and another loaf on the other end of the extreme, which will be maybe 12 hours of bulk fermentation. And when we bake these up and cut them open in the morning, the crumb should look exactly the same. That's really the purpose of this experiment is to show that just by changing that starter or leaven percentage that controls the bulk fermentation time, but it really does not Im impact the look of the crumb that we get at the end. So we should have four identical loaves of bread tomorrow after baking these up if this experiment works. I don't know if it will, we shall see. So now it is time to mix the dough. What I'm going to do is mix up four separate batches of this dough, very carefully measuring everything with the only difference being that leaven percentage being different between them. I mixed up my leaven the night before per the recipe from the Tartine Bread book. This is an overnight leaven bill. That smells really good right now. This leaven is the exact same leaven that will go into the four loaves. The only thing that's different is the quantity. So the only variable that we're changing is that quantity of the leaven. All other variables will be held exactly constant. Now, I'll do all this off camera because you don't need to see all the mixing. And then I'll come back in about two and a half hours after I've done, say, four of the stretch and folds in bulk fermentation. And then we'll pick the process up as we start to use the bulkomatic tool to identify when is bulk fermentation done. And we will then be able to compare the progress of these four loaves through that latter part of the bulk fermentation process. Now here at the Institute, in addition to sourdough baking science and research, I also do a little bit of dabbling in time travel. It helps with these baking videos because I need to do two and a half hours worth of work in the next few seconds of your time. So I've built this nuclear powered flux capacitor using my mixer and this turkey thermometer. And if I punch in here that I need to come back in two and a half hours, and then I turn this on, now I need to get this at exactly the right speed or I'll actually go back in time. Now I need to get this at exactly the right speed or I'll actually go back in time. Do you see what just happened there? Let me try this again. And we are back. It's two and a half hours later, my time, a few seconds later, your time. I really brought that in for a smooth landing. The takeoff is always a little harder than the landing with the flux capacitor. So what happened here? in the last two and a half hours. So I mix the dough, uh, flour, water, and starter, let that sit for 30 minutes per the recipe. Then I add the salt, let that sit for 30 minutes, and then I did four stretch and folds. I just finished the fourth stretch and fold. So we have four loaves going here. Loaf number one is our 30% leaven. Loaf number two is our 20% leaven, which is our baseline tartine recipe. Loaf number three, 10% leaven. Loaf number four, 5% leaven. I adjusted the formulas to make sure that the hydration is exactly the same across all of these and that the loaf size is exactly the same across all of these. So the hydration of this recipe, including the leaven hydration is 77.45%. So because the starter or the leaven brings its own water and flour with it, as you increase or decrease your leaven percentage, you can actually change the hydration of the dough as well. So always keep that in mind. I had to make some small adjustments to the flour and water ratios on the high leaven and, and the lower leaven to make sure that we weren't changing the overall hydration rate. So these loaves have been going for two and a half hours. There's a slight difference between the two. I'd say the 30% and 20% loaves feel a little bit more supple to me. I can feel that the fermentation is starting to work. The 10% and 5% loaves still feel fairly stiff, like a fairly young, mix. I've done four stretch and folds so far. 
We're two and a half hours in. I'm going to pause here. We'll come back at the three hour mark. So it's been three hours since we mixed the dough. The, the dough is still kind of rounded in the bowls from the last stretch and fold. It hasn't really relaxed down into the bowls yet, so I can't get a good measurement on the percent rise. Let's take the temperature and see where we are. 80 degrees, 79, 79, 79. Those are in Fahrenheit. That would be 26 degrees Celsius. So my target temperature is between 78 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 25.5 to 28 degrees Celsius. We're just under the midpoint. I like to get these up maybe one degree warmer, but they've been pretty consistently in this range since I mixed the dough. I've been tracking the temperature every 30 minutes. It started at 81 degrees Fahrenheit, went down to about 77 degrees Fahrenheit when I mixed the salt. That's typical because you're introducing room temperature air when you're mixing that dough by hand. Then it went 78 degrees, 79 degrees, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So we've been slightly below that midpoint of 80 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't have a lot other to report right now, so I'm gonna let these sit a little bit longer. Then we'll come back either at three and a half or four hours, and we'll do the first full test of the nine criteria on the Balkamatic system. It has been three and a half hours since we mixed the ingredients. Let's go through all nine criteria on the Balkamatic system and see where we are with these lobes. The first thing I always do is measure the temperature. When you're doing bulk fermentation, absolutely measure your dough every time you have the opportunity. That's really what is the most reliable indicator of progress. 80 degrees, 79 degrees, 79 degrees, 80 degrees. So we're right between 79 and 80. That's about 26, 26 and a half degrees Celsius. It's right where we want to be, right in the middle of that recommended range. The next criteria that we look at is time. Now time is the dependent variable in this, in this experiment. So the, the system is really calibrated for loaf number two, which is our 20% inoculation that says we should be finishing up bulk fermentation somewhere between three and a half to four and a half hours. It's three and a half hours right now, and we're not even close to being done here looking at loaf number two. That's pretty typical. I, I've never hit that three and a half hour mark in, in the Tartine uh, guidance. Usually my loaves will go four and a half to five and a half hours actually. For the percent rise, the book recommends 20 to 30% rise for this recipe. I'm really not seeing any percent rise yet. Then we look for characteristics of the dough. Is the dough domed on top? This is a little bit difficult to tell because the dough is still rounded from the last stretch and fold. Number one definitely seems more domed on top. It's really pushing up. There's a high shoulder around the edges of this that's unlike the other ones here. So number one looks more domed on top. The next thing we look for is are there bubbles on the top? I don't see any on loaf number one. I see some small bubbles on loaf number two. I don't see any on loaf number three. And I see a few big bubbles here on loaf number four. Surprisingly, that's our 5% uh, leaven loaf. That's interesting. Uh, then we look for, are there bubbles on the side? I, when I look for bubbles on the side of the bowl, that's like a preview into the crumb of the loaf. When you start to see bubbles on the side, that indicates that you're gonna have bubbles or air holes in your loaf. Number one, I'd say this looks pretty good. I'm seeing quite a few bubbles here on the side of that bowl. So I would call that uh, many bubbles. Uh, not really vigorous as if it were done, but that's in good shape. Loaf number two, definitely fewer bubbles on loaf number two. I'd call that a few. Loaf number three, similar to loaf number two. I call that a few bubbles. And loaf number four, even less. That has very, very few, few bubbles. So as you would expect, the bubbles on the side are showing more in loaf number one where we had the higher percentage of leaven. The next thing I do is the wobble test. That's where I just shake the bowl to see how much is the dough aerated. That still looks very stiff to me. That's a very stiff wobble. Similarly, loaf number two is still very stiff. Loaf number three, about the same. Loaf number four, about the same. So I'm really not seeing the aeration evident in the wobble test yet. 
Now let's do the window pane test. Now the window pane test is really to test, do we have sufficient gluten development? So people do this right after you finish your stretch and folds to see if you need to be doing more stretch and folds. I could tell in the last stretch and fold that this dough seemed like it had pretty good gluten development. This dough is incredibly stiff, uh, but I'm getting a really nice window pane there. But yeah, this dough feels stiff to me. This still has quite a long way to go. The good thing about doing the window pane is you get your hands on the dough and you can feel it. Let's try loaf number two to see if any of these feel different. This actually feels a little more supple to me. Loaf number two, look at that. And there's a gorgeous window pane right there. So we, we have plenty of gluten development in loaves one and two. This loaf feels pretty stiff to me, but look at that, beautiful. And this is even with some whole wheat in this dough, which usually will cause that to tear. That's a spectacular window pane. And then loaf number four. Again, feels a little stiff. Look at that. Beautiful. Beautiful window pane on loaf number four. So in terms of gluten development, we have sufficient gluten development in all these loaves, so I don't need to be doing more handling or more stretch and folds. What I'll be doing now is I'll be doing the window pane periodically throughout the rest of bulk fermentation to see if we're actually getting deterioration of the gluten, because that's an early indication of overproofing. If your loaves are taking a long time to rise, sometimes it's helpful to get your hands on the dough and pull the window pane late in the bulk fermentation process. And if you start to feel the dough breaking down in your hands and the window pane, that's an indication that you're heading towards overproofing. We're, we're nowhere near that right now, but that's the reason that I'll do the window pane later in this test as well. And then lastly is the smell test. This is super important. If you really get used to smelling your dough, if you do it all the time when you're bulk fermenting and every time you bake, you will start to smell exactly when your bulk fermentation is done. What I look for is what I call a ripe, sweet smell. When the dough first starts out in bulk fermentation, it smells like flour and water. You know that smell when you're mixing the dough. When your dough is over fermented, it smells like your starter, which is like vinegary and sour smelling. But in bulk fermentation, you'll get to this point where you'll start to get a hint of ripeness. It'll start to smell like ripe fruit. And then as you're finishing bulk fermentation, you'll smell a sweetness where I can almost taste the smell, if that makes sense, on the tip of my tongue. That's starting to get there. Loaf number one is what I would call ripe, but not really sweet. It's not, it doesn't smell like flour anymore. It's starting to smell ripe. Number two, this still smells more like flour to me. Number three, more like flour than number two. Number four, more like flour. You, you can really smell a continuum here. I know that you can't smell it, but I can smell a continuum here of very flowery, raw flour smell up to slightly starting to get the ripe smell in loaf number one. So we apply all of these criteria to the incredible bulkomatic indicator system. We are still really far to the left here in terms of our, do we have indications that bulk fermentation is done. So we're at three and a half hours. This batch just might take a little bit longer than expected. This feels to me like it's a little bit behind schedule, but the yeast doesn't know what time it is. We're the only ones who worry about the time. You just have to watch the dough. We'll use the other criteria. Time is the last thing that I'm worried about because that's what I want the system to tell us today is when all four of these are done, tell us what the time was when it was done. I'm not gonna be trying to force a schedule onto these loaves. So based on where these are right now, I'm gonna keep these in my proofing chamber at that 80 degree dough temperature, 27 degrees Celsius. And we'll check back in in about an hour, let's say four and a half hours since we mixed the dough, this is what that will be. So we are five and a half hours into bulk fermentation. I'm still not seeing much difference from what I reported last time. Loaf number one has more vigorous bubbling on the sides. Clearly, that's the one change that's visible here. 
I'd say there's a slight rise in loaf number one that's getting like it's looking like it's ready to make a move. Loaf number two, which really should be moving by now, I see about a 10% rise in loaf number two, fair number of bubbles around the sides there. Loaf number three, still sitting pretty much at its starting point. Loaf number four is at its starting point. So I'm just starting to see a little bit of rise in loaves one and two. My smell test, this is still, I'd say, slightly ripe smelling. It hasn't turned into that fermented sweet smell yet. So these just need a little more time. This is just a slow moving batch today, but that's why we use all these criteria because if I were just looking at time and even looking at temperature, my temperature is in a good place right now, 81 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 degrees Celsius, I could start second guessing myself and saying, Maybe this is done because the clock tells me it should be done. The temperature tells me it should be done, but none of the other variables indicate that it's done yet. So we're going to let this go a little bit longer. Okay, we are six and a half hours into bulk fermentation. Let's take a deep dive into loaf number one. I think this one might be getting close. So let's go through the complete assessment here and see where we are. First thing I always do is take the temperature. 79 degrees Fahrenheit. So this has been right in that preferred range the entire time that it's been bulk fermenting. So the temperature is good. The time, we're at six and a half hours. For the 20% inoculation loaf, the range is three and a half to four and a half. I said on average, mine usually goes five and a half. So this dough seems to be running a little bit slow compared to normal. Uh, but when I start to get up to six and a half hours, that's starting to push, I'd say, a long time for a 30% inoculation loaf. So even though I'm trying not to put too much emphasis on time, we just have to be aware of that. The next thing I look for is the percent rise. Now this loaf is really domed up on the top, almost like an ice cream cone. So it's hard to get a, an exact read on the percent rise here, but I think this is at 30% when I'm looking at it from the side. This, this all of a sudden, kind of puffed up in the last 30 to 35 minutes. And this is not uncommon with bulk fermentation. The vast majority of the rise will happen at the end. There's a real hockey stick effect. And you can see this in some of my other videos, one called bulk fermentation, mastering temperature and time, where I bulk ferment loaves at different temperatures. And they all follow the same curve. They, they're, when you look at the percent rise, it's flat, 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 and then boom, it goes up really quickly at the end. So this one definitely made the turn. It's at 30% rise. It's really mounted up on top. Let's look at the other criteria. Is it domed on top? Absolutely. That's like one of the biggest domes I've ever seen. Are there bubbles on the top? Not really. I see a few kind of, yeah, I'd say a few bubbles on top. This one really didn't get the big airy bubbles on top like I've seen before, but I see a few. Are there bubbles on the side? Absolutely, and this has been really throughout the process. I've seen really this vigorous bubble activity on the side of the bowl, so that looks pretty good. I do the wobble test. There you can start to see that loaf shaking. See the way that I call it splashing against the sides of the bowl? Almost look like it's liquefying. So all of a sudden this dough just aerated in the last 30 minutes. And speaking of bubbles on top, there's one right there that just came up. Then we do the window pane test. I just did that recently. Let me do it again, just to see where this ended up to ensure that we're not overproofing, and we're not. I can just tell this dough is stiff. This, this flour is a high gluten flour. I think I got a batch of super high gluten flour here with that fresh bag. Look at that window pane, perfectly translucent, no tearing. I mean, that's like a textbook window pane right there, late in the bulk fermentation process. So this looks really good. And then lastly, the smell test, totally changed the smell of this in the last 30 minutes. This is the sweet smell that I smell on the tip of my tongue, no matter how weird that, that sounds, that's the way I describe it. It smells like sugar. This is done. So let's put this up on the screen just so you can see what we're, what we're looking at here. Uh, all the criteria, many of these are falling within what I call that Goldilocks range or that box in the middle that says that this indicates that bulk fermentation is done. Now at this point, we also need to think about what happens next with this loaf, with really all these loaves. 
As I mentioned, I won't be pre-shaping or final shaping this. I'm just gonna flop this into a shaping basket. I am gonna let it sit on the counter for 30 minutes because that's what the recipe would call for typically between pre-shaping and final shaping. That's why this recipe only calls for a 20 to 30% rise because you still get that extra 30 minutes on the countertop between the shaping. And then this goes into the refrigerator for the overnight cold retard. And a common misconception that people have is that as soon as this goes into the refrigerator, it'll stop fermenting. It will not. If you look at this chart, I'll put this up on the screen. This is from a, uh, an ex experiment I did a couple of months ago where I put a continuous probe thermometer into a loaf. And this shows what happens to the dough temperature inside the refrigerator. It takes four hours for this dough to get down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's still fermenting. So this is really what happens with a lot of overproofing problems is people push the bulk fermentation too far. Then you do your bench rest, the dough is still fermenting. It doesn't know bulk fermentation's over just because you decided it is. It only knows the temperature. So it keeps fermenting for that 30 minutes on the counter. Then when it goes into the refrigerator, it keeps fermenting because it's still gonna be at 80 degrees for a couple minutes, 70 degrees for a little while, 60 degrees, 50 degrees, which is 10 degrees Celsius. Four hours later, the yeast finally realizes bulk fermentation is done and it starts to put on a jacket and slow down a little bit. But for the next four and a half hours, this dough will keep fermenting. This may actually overproof because this is a high leaven dough. This is going into the refrigerator supercharged with a lot of yeast and lactic acid lactic acid bacteria compared to the standard loaf in the book. So you're kind of like slowing down a speeding train when you, when you cut off bulk fermentation on this high leaven percentage loaf. This thing really wants to move now. I can tell just the way that it changed over the last 30 minutes. So I'm gonna get this into a shaving basket, do the 30 minutes on the countertop to be consistent with all the others against my better judgment. Then we'll put it into the refrigerator let this come down, cool down, and then we'll bake it up tomorrow morning after the overnight cold retard. Now, this is really a trick to get these out of this bowl without mauling the dough because I'm not doing any shaping. So I try not to compress too much air out of the dough. That dough feels real stiff to me. So that, that is not really at risk of overproofing right now. I think we caught that at the right time. Nice flop into the basket. That's a nice looking loaf. And then I like to shake this. And that's still, you know, that's got some nice movement. I'd say it's, it's definitely at the point where we want to cut it off from bulk fermentation. It's not an overproofed loaf. You'd see that thing really jiggling, more liquefied looking. So I'm gonna put this loaf into the refrigerator for the overnight cold retard. This is gonna be an interesting loaf because this looks about where I would normally cut off a loaf in bulk fermentation. But like I said, it's going into the fridge just supercharged with a lot of yeast and lactic acid bacteria. So it has the risk of overproofing. I'm not sure how this is gonna end up. It might end up perfectly fully proofed. It has been eight hours since we initially mixed the dough. I think loaf number two is getting pretty close here. So let's do the test on loaf, loaf number two. Uh, first thing we want to do is take the temperature, 79 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 26 degrees Celsius, right where we want to be. So this has been at the right temperature all day. The time, eight hours, is really pushing the limit. And this is for the standard tartine recipe, where this normally takes five and a half hours or so. So this is just a slow moving batch. Maybe my leaven was a little bit weak this morning. The percent rise, I'm looking for 30%. This is right at 30%. Uh, yes, I'd call that just at 30. So that's just where it needs to be. Is it domed on top? It is. It has a nice shoulder around the edges. Do we see bubbles on top? I see a few bubbles, one, two, three, four bubbles around the edges. So I'd call that a fair number of bubbles on top. Do we see the bubble activity on the sides? Yes, I would say fairly vigorous bubble activity on the side of the bowl. The wobble test, loose, that's loose and aerated. Not quite, uh, I was gonna say not quite as loose as loaf number one, but I think it actually is. Again, I look at how much of that dough splashes against the sides of the bowl. 
that's a pretty loose loaf. The window pane, this is really just a test at this point, get my hands on the dough before we wrap it up to see mm -hmm. how it feels and to make sure that it's not overproofing. And similar to loaf number one, beautiful. That just tore at the end there. Let me try that again. Okay, yeah, this dough is weakening a little bit compared to loaf number one. So I am getting a little bit of gluten deterioration here uh, in this one. So we definitely don't want to prolong this anymore. And then the smell, it's not as sweet as loaf one. It's more that ripe smell just on the border of being sweet. So this one has a little bit of a mixed bag. It's not quite as clear cut as loaf number one, but the vast majority of these items are in the range for determining that bulk fermentation is done. Here's the bulk matic chart for loaf number two. You can see where each one of those criteria fell relative to the desired range. So let's take this out and get it into a shaping basket. Now, I also can feel the dough as I'm taking it out. This dough feels really good. Like it's a cohesive ball of dough. When you start to get overproofing, I would see all that webbing, all the gluten webbing around the edges, and it would be incredibly sticky and stuck to the sides of the bowl. I'm not feeling that. This feels really nice and airy. Then I look at how much that droops in my hand. It's like a nice, fairly solid batch of dough, very similar to loaf number one. If I had to describe any differences between this and loaf number one, very tough. Loaf number one might have been slightly more aerated. Then we shake it. It's really nice movement on that dough. I'd say that's really nicely proofed right now. So loaf number two, we give this our 30 minute bench rest. And then this goes into the refrigerator for the overnight cold retard. We'll bake it up tomorrow. Now, while we're here, let's just take a quick look at loaves number three and four. That's sitting at about 15% rise on loaf number three. Loaf number four is also sitting at about a 15% rise. Those look okay. They're starting to get a little dried out on the top. They just need more time. It has been 11 and a half hours since we mixed the dough. It looks like loaf number three is about done. Let's take a closer look. So loaf number three, this is our 10% leaven loaf. That's half of the normal inoculation rate. And this one is sitting at about 11 and a half hours. The 20% loaf was done in about eight hours. The 30% loaf in six and a half hours. So these are trending in the right direction. I don't know if I can really see a pattern there yet. This is at 79 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 degrees Celsius. That's really been at that perfect temperature for the entire 11 and a half hours. Uh, the percent rise is right at 30%. This one took a long time to get moving, but it rose like the others. It just was a bit slower. Is this domed on top? It is, but I'd say this is a little flatter on top and a little, um, starting to dry out and dehydrate a little bit, but it is domed on the top. Are there bubbles on the top? Absolutely. This is actually one of the more bubbly ones that I've seen with the big uh, bulbous ones there on the top. Are there bubbles on the side? I would say yes. I'd say not quite as many as we saw in loaves one and two, and these bubbles are a little bit smaller in size, more like pinpoint size, but we have bubbles on the side. The wobble test looks pretty good. Loose and aerated, very similar to loaf number two, I would say, the way that that one's moving. Let's pull a window pane, see how our gluten is holding up. We obviously had a really strong window pane early on. Let's see if we're getting any deterioration. Similar to the others, it's weakening a little bit. It's similar to loaf number two. Yeah, we're starting to get a little bit of gluten deterioration here. So this is definitely done. And it has that sweet smell. It just moved from ripe to sweet in the last 30 minutes or so. This is definitely done. Let's move this into our shaping basket. 
This feels almost identical to the prior one, loaf number two. Loaf number one was a little firm. This one feels loose and airy. And then scooping it out, you can see that one's drooping a little bit more than the prior loaf. So this one might be a little bit further along just based on the time that it took to get that rise. And now that it's in the basket, let's do the shake. That looks pretty similar. I think it's slightly looser, slightly further along than the other loaves. That one might have, we might have been able to pull that one, I don't know, 30 or 45 minutes ago. Here's a summary of the bulkomatic chart for loaf number three. You can see that the vast majority of the indicators are in the desired range. Now loaf number four is sitting here at about 15% rise. It's 10 p.m. right now. Uh, so this is probably gonna finish up sometime in the middle of the night. I will check on this periodically, but I probably will not do a live recording of the update if it finishes say at 2 a.m. I'll report back on this one in the morning. It's the morning of day two. Now loaf number four did finish up in the middle of the night at 2.30 a.m. That was 16 hours after we mixed the dough. That loaf looked really good at 2.30 a.m., but I did not, so I did not record that one live. But I was able to document in a semi-delirious state what that loaf looked like. So let me put up the chart and I'll give you the rundown here. The temperature was at 79 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 degrees Celsius throughout probably 13 hours. In the last few hours, it dropped down to about 76 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to call that, that still pretty close to 79 over the duration of the bulk fermentation. The time was 16 hours, as I mentioned, from where, when we mixed the dough. The percent rise was right at 30%, similar to the other loaves. The dough was domed up on top, very similar to loaf number three. There were bubbles on the top, similar to loaf number three. Bubbles on the side had deflated somewhat, so it was more of the small pinpoint sized bubbles, so I moved that indicator over to the right. The wobble test, it was loose and aerated, but not quite as loose and aerated as some of the other loaves, and this will happen with long bulk fermentations as the loaf just starts to dehydrate and get a little bit less active. The window pane started to weaken, very similar to what we saw in loaf three, almost identical, and the smell continued to deliver that perfect sweet smell right in the middle of the chart. So that's the summary of loaf number four. So now that we've finished all four of these loaves, let me just put up the chart to recap loaf one, two, three, and four. And I'll just quickly go through these. You can pause if you wanna look at these in more detail, but it's helpful to see them in succession. So loaf number one, this bulk fermented for 6.5 hours. That was our 30% leaven loaf. Loaf number two, bulk fermented for eight hours. That was our 20% leaven loaf. That was our baseline tartine recipe. Loaf number three, 11 and a half hours. That was our 10% leaven loaf. And loaf number four, 16 hours. That was our 5% leaven loaf. So that's the summary of the four loaves. Now that we've completed all the bulk fermentation, let me just say that all of the times that we're seeing here are longer than I expected. Even the 20% standard loaf that I follow by the book from the recipe, that time went longer than typical. All these times seemed long. So I think what happened was in retrospect, my leaven probably was not up to full strength. It's the middle of winter here in Cleveland. I do that overnight leaven build as called for in the recipe. And it was probably in the low 60s in my kitchen the night that I made the leaven. The leaven looked okay in the morning. I did the float test and it passed the float test even though that's not a 100% reliable indicator. I just have a feeling that my leaven wasn't up to full production. But I think the relative difference in these times would be exactly the same. If one loaf was faster, they all would have been slightly faster. So we're gonna look at the relative difference in these times, which I think would be consistent even if the leaven had been up to full strength. So now it is time to score and bake the loaves. Let me just recap the process. So after bulk fermentation, you saw I didn't do pre-shaping or final shaping. I just flopped the dough into the shaping baskets. 
I left it on the countertop for a 30 minute bench rest. Then they went into the refrigerator for a cold retard. Loaf number one is coming out of the refrigerator now at about 14 hours of a cold retard. My kitchen, my refrigerator temperature is 37 degrees Fahrenheit, which is three degrees Celsius. So these get really cold once they get down to room to refrigerator temperature. Because I'm taking loaf one out after 14 hours, I'll be taking all the successive loaves out over the course of today. So they all have that consistent 14 hour cold retard in the refrigerator. So this should be a very exact comparison of both the fermentation time based on the percent rise and the bulkomatic indicators, and then a consistent 14 hour cold retard after the 30 minute bench rest. Now I'll do the scoring and baking off camera. There's really not a lot to see there. I basically take the loaves out of the shaping basket. I flop them on the parchment paper. I score them with my blade. I don't do any shaping at all. I put them into my Dutch oven. They go into the, to the preheated Dutch oven in the oven, which is preheated at 500 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 260 degrees Celsius. I bake them at 450 degrees Fahrenheit with the lid on for 20 minutes. That's 232 degrees Celsius. Then I take the lid off for the last 15 minutes or so. These loaves bake up in about 35 minutes total time. After I bake the loaves, we'll come back, we'll compare all the loaves, we'll cut them open, we'll do the assessment. And if this experiment worked, all four of these loaves, even, they have, even though they have wildly different bulk fermentation times, should look exactly the same on the outside. And when we cut them open, the crumbs should look exactly the same on the inside. The four loaves have baked and cooled. Let's take a look at what we have here. So I have, starting on my left, number one, the 30% leaven, 20% leaven, 10% leaven, 5% leaven. The total fermentation, bulk fermentation time, six and a half hours, eight hours, 11 and a half hours, 16 hours. Bulk fermentation plus the bench rest, plus the cold proofing in the refrigerator, 21 total hours, 22.5 total hours, 26 total hours, 30.5 total hours. So what do we have here? My first reaction is that these loaves look amazing, uh, par partially because we didn't do any pre-shaping or final shaping. I continue to be amazed by this, even though I do this in quite a few of these videos. Just look at this loaf. I mean, that's a loaf with no pre-shaping and no final shaping. That is bulk fermented dough. And as I've said in many of these videos in the past, bulk fermentation makes the bread. Pre-shaping is overrated, final shaping is overrated. If you really have good gluten structure and bulk ferment and proof your dough properly, that is 90% of what you get at the end of a good loaf. So loaf number one, if we just look at these individually now, really tall, beautifully shaped loaf. I mean, that's just a gorgeous loaf all around. Loaf number two, very similar. This is also really nice oven spring, a nice ear, overall good symmetry and shape. When we get into loaf three, I start to see this loaf is relaxed a little bit. So this one looks like it's pushing towards overproofing. Started to get a little wide in the midsection. It's a little bit lower. We still got a nice ear on this one, but it just looks a little bit misshapen compared to loaves one and two. And then low four, this one really looks relaxed, like we're starting to get into the territory of gluten deterioration on loaf number four. So that's really the general trend that I see here in the loaves. Now, the reality is that what's happening here is that when we ferment our loaves through bulk fermentation and through final proofing, there are two things going on. We have the yeast trying to rise the loaf and fill it with carbon dioxide. And we have the lactic acid bacteria that basically over time, it starts to deteriorate or eat the gluten. Actually, it releases something called the protease enzyme, which eats the gluten and deteriorates the loaf. So you can see that really clearly in these four loaves, they go from taller to shorter. This is just the impact of time. And because these were really long bulk fermentations, longer than normal, you're constantly fighting against time because the longer the clock ticks away, every second of the clock ticking away, that protease enzyme is eating and deteriorating the gluten. You can really see it here. If you just look across the top of those four loaves, they go from taller to shorter. I mean, almost as if you were trying to show an example 
of that just based on the clock running in the background. There's really nothing we can do about this in terms of a proofing perspective or trying to cut off bulk fermentation shorter or longer. This is really just the indication of the clock. When you ferment a loaf for 30 and a half hours, it's going to be a flatter, more relaxed loaf than a loaf that ferments for 21 hours. So that's really evident here that we have the gluten deterioration in the background. Now, what do you do about that? The, the one thing in this experiment uh, specifically is that, as I indicated earlier, I believe my leaven was a little bit weaker than normal because all these fermentation times were longer, even the one that I normally make, loaf number two. Uh, so if you're doing a long proofing or a long bulk fermentation, like in loaves three and four with the, the low inoculation percentage, you wanna absolutely have the strongest leaven or the strongest starter possible because you're fighting against the clock. What you wanna do is you want the yeast to be as strong as possible so the yeast can rise the loaf as quickly as possible before the lactic acid bacteria has time to deteriorate the gluten. That's a constant battle that you have with proofing that's really evident here. Now, the way I like to think about this is through an analogy. It's like when you're mixing your dough you're throwing a party where you invited the yeast to come to the party to rise the dough. The yeast brings along an uninvited party guest, the lactic acid bacteria. And the way that the yeast works when it's rising the dough, it's sitting down on the sofa, it's knitting a sweater, it's sipping a little bit of whiskey, it's eating a cucumber sandwich. The lactic acid bacteria is in the kitchen eating all your food, doing beer bongs on the counter, jello shots, drinking whiskey, emptying your liquor cabinet. And the difference is that the yeast, after it finishes its job, it takes a nap. It kind of follows a curve where it goes up in activity and then it slows down. The lactic acid bacteria never slows down. That thing just parties until dawn. So that's what you're seeing here is that the lactic acid bacteria outran the yeast. And that's this this curve that you see here in the declining height of these loaves is just the impact of the clock and the fact that lactic acid bacteria is at the party. Every hour that clicks away, you're gonna to start to get this deterioration of the gluten. So the exterior view of these loaves tells us about the deterioration of gluten over a long period of time. Now let's start cutting these open and look specifically at the proofing of the crumb on each loaf. So loaf number one, this is our 30% leaven, six and a half hours bulk fermentation, really nice looking loaf. I mean, beautiful height, beautiful ear. That's really a perfectly proofed loaf. So we cut that one off at exactly the right point. That was uh, six and a half hours of bulk fermentation, 30 minute bench rest, and then into the refrigerator for 14 hours. I don't have a lot more to say about that loaf. That is really a spectacularly proofed loaf right there. Loaf number two, this is our 20% leaven, bulk fermented for eight hours. That's another fantastically proofed loaf. I mean, that is amazing. And now let's compare this to loaf number one. This is really the essence of the experiment right here. It's almost impossible to tell the difference between those two loaves. 30% leaven on my left at six and a half hours looks exactly the same as 20% leaven on the right, bulk fermented for eight hours. That was the whole goal of the experiment that shows that if you can control the cutoff of your bulk fermentation time, you can get exactly the same type of proofing of a loaf with different leaven percentages. Loaf number three. Now these were starting to get into that really long proofing territory, 11.5 hours of bulk fermentation with 10% leaven. I gotta say three for three on that one. I mean, that crumb looks nearly identical to loaf number two, 
I'd have a hard time telling those apart and very similar to loaf number one as well. You can see that the shape of the loaf is changing a little bit as we move through these. That's that kind of background deterioration of the gluten, but the proofing that's really evidenced in the crumb, which is the distribution of small, medium, and large holes through that loaf, really looks amazing. That's loaf number three. And then loaf number four, this is our 5% leaven, 16 hours of bulk fermentation. This loaf definitely is relaxed, started to lose some of its integrity. Now this crumb is slightly more dense and a little more gummy. So I believe that this loaf is heading into overproofing territory. It is. When I really look at the how small the cells are, when you really look closely at this, this is what an overproofed loaf starts to look like. I also see a little bit of separation of the crust and the crumb. That's an indication of overproofing. So this was my late night loaf, the 2.30 a.m. loaf. Uh, this one went a little bit too far. So I think this was a combination of that background deterioration of the gluten and just letting this one go probably an hour too long. If you go back and look at the balcomatic chart for this loaf, you can see that some of the variables were definitely pushing to the right. There were indications that this was heading towards overproofing and it definitely was right on the edge there. Now here's a closer look at the crumb of loaves one, two, three, and four side by side and up close. So you can really see how similar the proofing was on these and where the small differences were on that loaf number four. I mean, loaves one, two, and three, uh, almost interchangeable, low four, slightly different. Now the bisection of the crumb doesn't always tell the whole story. So I'm going to slice these loaves and look a little bit deeper to see if there's anything else to learn. So I was pretty happy with the results on the bisection. Now that I've cut this into slices, I'm really just blown away. What I've done here is I've taken four slices out of each loaf. Loaf number one, 30% leaven. Loaf number two, 20% leaven. Loaf number three, 10% leaven. Loaf number four, 5% leaven. This is six and a half hours of bulk fermentation, eight hours of bulk fermentation, 11 and a half hours of bulk fermentation, 16 hours of bulk fermentation. I mean, these, lo these loaves look so similar. The slices look so similar that if I told you I cut these four out of the same loaf, you probably would have believed me. If I told you these four were out of the same loaf, I would believe that. If I mixed all these up and had to reassemble them into the original loaves, I couldn't do it. They're that similar. I mean, loaf number four, really based on the shape of the loaf and somewhat the crumb, is a little bit of an outlier versus one, two, and three. But even if I thought this was the last cut at the end of a loaf, I would believe that that came out of this loaf or this loaf or that loaf. So what did we learn here is that when you're trying to determine when to cut off bulk fermentation, ignore the clock. I mean, if I had used the guidance, uh, even for my standard recipe and cut this loaf off at five and a half hours, which is normally what it takes, this would have been underproofed. If I used that guidance for all the other loaves to try to determine when they were done, they all would have been underproofed. I mean, I can say that unequivocally, I would have cut all of these off too early and underproofed them. But by ignoring the clock and looking at all the other variables that you have available to you, you can determine that perfect point to cut off bulk fermentation so that even when you're using a different leaven percentage and you have wildly different times in your bulk fermentation, all four of these were largely cut off in a very close window to each other with the exception of number four, which either we missed the window maybe by an hour or this was just that accumulated effect of the gluten deterioration that comes with long fermentations. I'm not really sure. It's probably a combination of both. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the other thing you have to keep in mind when you're changing the leaven percentage in your loaves is that it can also impact the flavor of the loaves. So I did a taste test of these four loaves. I also employed the services of a completely independent judge, my wife. She tasted all four as well. And basically they kind of fall into two categories. One and two were not significantly different from each other, the 30% and 20% inoculation loaves. 
and these were fairly mild tasting. They had a little bit of the sour flavor, and then loaves three and four kind of were comparable to each other, the 10% and 5%, uh, 11 percentages. These had more of that pronounced sourness. You really feel it in the back of your tongue, that tangy kick to it, clearly in loaf three and in loaf four. So they kind of fell into two classes. There was not a real discernible continuum of mildly sour to super sour across the four lobes. It was kind of like less sour one and two, more sour three and four. Now some people mistakenly believe that when you add more starter or more leaven to your loaf as we did in loaf number one, you would think that that loaf would be more sour. The sourness doesn't come from the starter itself. It comes from the activity of the lactic acid bacteria. And the lactic acid bacteria loves time. The more time it has, the harder it works. It's the, it just doesn't stop working. So the longer time that you have creates more of the tanginess, which is what we saw here in loaves three and four with total fermentation time, including the cold retard, 26 hours on loaf number three, 30.5 hours on loaf number four versus 21 hours on loaf number one, 22 and a half on loaf number two, which is not short, but that bulk fermentation time was relatively short. So when you're building the population of your lactic acid bacteria, those just cut, get cut a little bit shorter than loaves three and four. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, the purpose of this experiment was really to help you as a baker understand the impact of different leaven percentages on baking times so that you have more control over your baking schedule. So now you can estimate what happens if I add more leaven to my recipe, how much can I speed it up? And what happens if I take leaven out of my recipe, how much can I slow it down? So let's just summarize what we have here. The first thing that we proved is that the leaven percentage is clearly related to the bulk fermentation time. This was pretty obvious, but these are the data points. Loaf number one at 30%, six and a half hours. Loaf number two, 20%, eight hours. Loaf number three, 10% leaven, 11.5 hours. Loaf number four at 5% was 16 hours. And as we saw that loaf number four was slightly overproofed. Maybe we should have pulled that an hour earlier. Or maybe that should have been more like 15 hours. I don't think it would have been materially less than that. Now let's plot these on the X and Y axis on the next chart so you can really see the shape of the curve here. And this is a curve that you'll often see things like this in nature or in fermentation. So this looks very consistent with what I would have expected. It's not a straight line. It's more of an exponential style curve. So here you see loaf number one at 30%, loaf number two at 20%, loaf number three at 10%, and loaf number four at 5% the curve flattens out at the bottom. So it's again, not a straight line. But we also know that loaf number four overproofed at 16 hours. So if we were trying to use this curve for estimating purposes, that data point is not useful. So I would suggest that we arbitrarily move that from 16 hours to 15 hours. That would assume that that loaf was more appropriately proofed at 1.30 a.m. versus when I pulled it at 2.30 a.m. And then that becomes a more useful data point for us. We know with certainty from looking at the crumb that 16 hours is not correct. I don't know if 15 hours is exactly correct, but it's certainly better than 16 based on the evidence that we had before our eyes when we looked at that crumb. So now we can take this adjusted curve and apply this to other scenarios. Now, as I mentioned in this video, all of these fermentation times were much longer than what I typically see with this recipe. And I can only surmise that that is because my leaven was weaker than normal. With a normal strength leaven, loaf number two, the 20% leaven loaf, typically would have been done with bulk fermentation at 5.5 hours based on all the probably 100 times I've made this recipe. So now we can use this curve and the relative times between those data points to say that if loaf number two had taken the standard 5.5 hours, Loaf number one at 30% leaven would have been done with bulk fermentation in 4.5 hours. Loaf number three, 7.9 hours. And loaf number four, 10.3 hours. Similarly, we can apply this curve against the standard guidance in the tartine recipe, which calls for bulk fermentation to be done in four and a half hours. Assuming that that is the standard for loaf number two, we could then calculate that loaf number one using the standard guidance from Tartine 
would have been done in 3.7 hours, loaf number 3, 6.5 hours, and loaf number 4, 8.4 hours. So if we put this into some simple rules to follow that focus on what happens if you cut your leaven percentage in half from a known recipe, and what happens when you double your leaven percentage from a known recipe, because you always have to have a starting point. Everybody has a recipe that they know or that they're using to begin with, and you want to understand what happens if I modify it. So now let's talk about what happens if you have a known recipe and you decrease your leaven percentage from your known recipe. So let's say you have a recipe starting with 30% leaven and you want to cut that in half so you go to 15%. That would increase your bulk fermentation time by about 50%. So if it takes six hours at, at 30%, it would take nine hours at, at 15%. Now, if you have a, a recipe that starts with 20% leaven and you cut that in half, and you go to 10%, that should increase your bulk fermentation time by about 44%. So these are some rules of thumb that show how can you increase or stretch out your bulk fermentation time by reducing your leaven quantity. So now let's talk about how to speed up your bulk fermentation by increasing the leaven from a known recipe. If I have a recipe that calls for 20% leaven, and I increase that to 30%, that should decrease my bulk fermentation time by 19% based on this, this experiment. If I have a recipe that calls for 10% and I increase that to 20%, that should decrease my bulk fermentation time by 30%. That's based on the results of this one example. So for those people who are trained in the scientific method, they will look at these results and say, one data point does not make a trend. I agree but one data point is better than zero data points, which is what we had prior to this video. After I completed this study, I went out and looked at some of these tables and spreadsheets that people had posted on the internet, and I compared this to our results here. None of these were remotely close to the results that actually occurred here, either in terms of the relative difference in the time or the absolute times that it took for bulk fermentation. So these were really not useful. So now we have one data point that we didn't have yesterday, so what can you do as a citizen scientist? You can take a known recipe, you can increase or decrease your leaven percentage off of that recipe. You can use the incredible bulkomatic indicator system to determine when to cut off bulk fermentation, and you can post your results in the comments so that we can all learn and we can start to build up a knowledge base of what is the impact of changing the leaven percentage on bulk fermentation times. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I certainly did. Good luck in your sourdough journey. Now I am going to eat some bread.